Somebody gave me some a piece of advice and, and she said, how many iPhones are there? And I was like, I don't know, there was like six or whatever at the time. She goes, well, if Apple can keep getting better every time they release an iPhone, why can't you just put this out now and change it in the future? And that gave me permission to like move on, move forward, which is so thankful that that was some of the best advice I've ever gotten. And so I was like, all right, we're done. Started with the label, started selling it online and that was it. Welcome, Josh Newman. Thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you on the pod. Excited to be here. Yeah, and chat a little bit about your your latest venture and your latest journey here with uh, Kind Lips. But we've known each other for a long time. I was just thinking about that, Mike. I think we've known each other for like 18 years. Yeah, at least, yeah. So 18, you like 19? I mean, close to 20. Yeah, for you, sure. Yeah, you were there uh, right when, so when we, the way Josh and I connected was in the mortgage industry, right? I worked right. for a little teeny brokerage, and then that didn't really it lasted me like a year as a mortgage broker, and I closed like four loans because I had dealing with health things at the time. And then, probably enough to survive too. I think yeah. at that point in your life, <laughs> I lived at home with my parents, so yeah. it didn't take much, right? <laughs> and uh, so there's hope for everyone listening. Yeah, there is, right? Like it was a slow start. I'm the well, you know, 20 year overnight success story. Yeah. But then the second mortgage company, alternative mortgage options, you and I, I think you were there from day one. AMO. When, yeah. yeah. AMO back in 2000. That was probably about 05, 06. I don't even remember that long ago. Yeah. And it was uh, you and I and uh, a, a few of us all together. It was like four loan officers working in that little building in downtown Hudson. Yeah. We had no idea what we were doing either. No clue. Like, <laughs> yeah. So funny to think about that, that we are advising people yeah. what they should do with the biggest financial choices of their life. And we're like 25 years old, like just stumbling through life right. on our own. Didn't have any money. And all I, the money I had, I spent it on stuff I didn't need. So Yeah. And you'd borrow me 500 bucks here or there just to get by. <laughs> like. <laughs> So it was a fun time, but it's fun that we both kind of, we both got to grow up like in real estate together, kind of. Yeah. This is the way I look at yeah. it. Because I was 25. How old were you back then? I'm 24. Yeah. Yeah. So was that your first career? Right out of college. Yeah. I went to school to be a special education teacher and with student teaching. I was like, I don't want to teach. And then that was, uh, AMO was right, was my first job. It was. Yeah. Oh, Okay. That's super cool. So you're cutting your teeth and just learning. Yeah, I was in the, there was an office in New Richmond. I was in there for a little bit. And then I think they shut that down and I moved over to Hudson. Yeah, that was an interesting time in the mortgage and real estate business too, because it was like the tail end of the boom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we saw the tail end of the boom and then right into the crash. Just like bad. Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, and for the listeners, like that crash, like we have like a real estate slowdown right now, not a crash. It's just, there's high prices, people have money, and just less sales. Back then, it was like utter decimation. Yeah, it was everybody's interest rates where prices were going up so quick, and then all of a sudden, they had the uh, the adjustable rate mortgages, and they all went from 3.5% to 5.5%, and then you know nobody could afford their mortgage at that point. And people were losing their jobs, too. Yeah, they're losing their jobs. Hey, I need to refinance. We're like, well, you bought that house for three fifty, and it's worth two and a quarter. Right? Who <laughs> look and... That was, those were like not, I look back at that and think like, that was not very fun. I remember, you know, I had bought my first house during that period and I did a, I still hardly didn't even know what I was doing and wasn't making any money. And I did a stated income loan and bought, you know, said I made $30,000 a month or whatever on the stated income loan and, and, and started buying houses, you know, and I think at the, I had like seven houses at the end of it all, you know, I was like. I had no idea what I was doing and I should not have, I wouldn't have lent money to myself. Yeah. You know, at that point in my life. Yeah, man. I remember at that time, like I was like super jealous of you because I was so broke and I had so little money. You're like buying all this stuff, but then like come to learn in the background. It's like, there was just the loan program yeah. that allowed you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy how that, I mean, hopefully they don't bring those back ever. I don't think that, that's, I think that shit was kind of sad. Let's hope so. Yeah. So for us, we got to know each other. We've known each other a long time, kind of in and out uh, over the years. And, but I always really enjoy staying in touch with you. And I'm curious on like your journey. So Kind Lips is your company now, and we'll kind of get into that. But I'm curious, like, 
how did you go from mortgage, right? And then you transitioned eventually into real estate. And like, what did that journey look like to then come in into kind lips? Yeah. So, you know, doing mortgage and I, it, it was great when you got a deal close because you'd make a lot of money. But the hard part early on in starting it, was they were far and few between. And I had the ups and downs of the industry were, you know, taxing on me. And I was in my mid to late 20s. And I was like, I want to do, you know, I want to have a family. I want to get married. I don't want to, you know, I would need stability. And I wasn't smart enough or disciplined enough at that time to to save. So if I had a big month, I'd spend a bunch. And then I would, you know, out of necessity, not spend any money the next couple of months until I got paid. And so I like, I'm like, I'm done with mortgage. Like I can't be in this industry. And I bounced around a lot and was like, what am I going to do with my life? What do I like? And I had a fifth job interview for a commodity trading firm in Minneapolis. And, and I ended up not getting the job and I was crushed. I was like, I can't go back to mortgage. And I had a good friend reach out and he's like, Hey, will you come help at our real estate company? He's like, we need people to do leasing. I was like, I don't want anything to do with real estate or mortgage. And then, um, and he kept asking me and it was like a month later, I still couldn't find a job. And I'm like, fine, I'll go help out, you know, make a little extra money or make some money. So I could go out on the weekends that's where I, the point I was at in my life. And so started doing um, real estate leasing and fell in love with it instantly. And I don't know what, if it was just a different season of life or, you know, my mom had been praying for me or whatever it was, but it, it was just, it ended up working out and it was, I knew that's where I was supposed to be and started helping out leasing in Minneapolis. And, and that was a great way to learn um, downtown Minneapolis, learn where the buildings are, learn how to get in the buildings, learn where the amenities are, the lock boxes. And it's something that if you, you know, if you're doing sales, you don't get enough opportunities to rapidly learn that. So I was able to do in leasing, I was able to rapidly learn all the ins and outs of every building. Yeah. Um, the context I think is important here. Yeah. So you grew up in New Richmond, Wisconsin, yep. which is a very outlying suburb of the Twin Cities, I would look at it, right? Yeah. Like, so small town. Absolutely. So for you growing up small town, Wisconsin, to then go and transition to live in downtown Minneapolis. It's like not even the same world. You know, once you're down, once you're in Minneapolis, it becomes a small city, but yeah, yeah. you know, it's definitely a lot, lot more people on the streets and than in New Richmond. <laughs> so yeah, a lot more dinner options. Was that exciting? Was that nerve wracking? Like for you to transition or did you feel like, Hey, I'm ready for this. And it's like, you know, I remember living in, in New Richmond and uh, I had been dating this girl for a long time and we broke up. And I was like, I need to, you know, I grew up in high school in Richmond. Then I went to college at Eau Claire, then back to New Richmond. I was like, I, I want to go see more of the world. And then broke up with um, this girl. And I like, that was a Sunday night. And I left for Europe the following Wednesday. So I bought a ticket that night, left, didn't know where, I didn't have a place to stay. So I got into Europe and been in Europe for a couple of weeks. And I was like, got back home. And I was like, man, this world's a lot bigger then I remember you doing that. I remember yeah. how crazy that was. So it's like, oh, it's like, it was absolutely you, crazy. You just bought a ticket. <laughs> You're going to Europe. No plans, right? Didn't you go with like a backpack? Yeah. Just had a backpack. Didn't know where I was staying or nothing. Didn't have yeah. anything scheduled. And and so, I mean, it, I would never recommend anybody do it that way. <laughs> but uh, but I learned a lot. Uh, Got back to New Richmond. I was like, okay, like I need to I need to leave. What's the next biggest city? Minneapolis was the logical next biggest city. So I was like, let's go because I need to be around more people and and uh, experience more of life. Okay, that's, that's really cool. But it's just cool that you're showing people, you're introducing people to these condos and why you should lease here. Like, had you already been living there for a while by this time? Not that long. I mean, probably outskirts of Minneapolis and then downtown Minneapolis for maybe like four or five months prior to to working with this real estate firm downtown. So you're opening doors and learning about this. Yeah. As you're showing them the property. Yeah. Like, the seven like, days a week, honestly, I, I, I mean, it was, that was the, the beautiful part for me is I hated, I hated lead generation. That was not my strength. I don't like sales, but I do like building relationships with people. And so it ended up being, uh, in hindsight, it was a perfect scenario because I worked under a team that had all sorts of leads 
but they didn't have anybody that was out there producing. So I could just build relationships with everyone I was meeting. And so I, I was seven days a week and I was at the office, I mean, for sure, 12 hours a day. Wow. And I loved it. And I was just like, cause I was, I felt like I was having an impact. I was learning. I was starting to make a little bit of money, you know? And so when you're doing leasing, you don't make that much money, but it was like, it was more money than I had. And I felt like I was accomplishing something. Um, so I fell in love with it. And then, you know, after doing leasing for two and a half years, it was kind of, you know, I saw what the people that were helping the buy and sell side, what they were making. I was like, well, this seems like a natural progression. And it also built up my database really quick doing the leasing. So I had a lot of people that, you know, were going to live somewhere for 12 to 24 months and then would want to buy. Mm-hmm. And so I transitioned over to the the buy sell side and, um, yeah, and it just took off. No, and Joe Grenet, right? DRG. With DRG, who I've met, yep. not from you at all. I met him in like Scottsdale, Arizona at a coaching conference. So it's kind of funny. And I met him in 2013. Okay. Yeah, so like totally separate from you. Yeah, so yeah. Work DR, or Joe was uh, the broker owner there, and, and that's where I started. That's where I met Ben. Ganji was there, and so I teamed up with him. So I was his leasing agent. So he was a buying, selling agent. And then all the leads that, you know, his website would generate or his personal business would generate would come to me. So I'd help all the leasing side. So it did, it's been independent at this time? No, like, he was at DRG. Still at DRG? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Cool. And then after being there for a while, then um, then then we transitioned over to Sotheby's and went down that route. And that was an interesting thing because working at DRG was, you know, I like to, I mean, DRG is an amazing company and, and they know downtown as well as anybody all the agents but the one thing that drg um i didn't have a perspective of being outside of drg or being outside of downtown and i and when i got to sotheby's i realized like oh there's a lot of expensive homes and a lot of homes outside of downtown only and so if you start in the suburbs and you try and sell downtown it doesn't work but if you start downtown you learn those buildings that sort of stuff it's a lot easier to transition to single family homes and so I was able to do both and, and transition a lot of people from out of condos into single family homes. Um, where so you're selling real estate at this time. Yeah. This okay. is like after I transitioned to Sotheby's selling real estate. Yeah. Um, and just honestly, I still loved it. And I, that's the only way I could work, work as much as I did and never get sick of it. You guys are killing it. Like between you and Ben, I don't know how high you guys got in volume. We did, we, it we did a lot. And, and I mean, Ben's still doing really well, I mean, I think he did a hundred million bucks last year by himself and an assistant, you know, and, and I loved like the efficiencies and, you know, I think I was doing like 25 to 30 every year. And at that point, which for people listening is huge considering the average realtor sells like six houses a year. Well, the thing that I was most proud of is, is, you know, I had a, an assistant and she worked her hours were nine to noon. I was like, you, if you answer your phone afternoon, that's on you. I don't expect you to, you're never going to get in trouble like nine to noon, Monday through Friday. And I did I never did an open house. I never did, you know, I didn't try not to work on the weekends after I had already got established because I had gone through, you know, not having any boundaries with my personal life. And, you know, you'd start, I'd go on a date and start hanging around a girl and she'd be like, oh, I don't mind that you're answering your phone at 9 p.m. or whatever time, you know, or Sundays or Saturdays. And then finally I'd have to, you know, it's like that became where I'd they felt like I was choosing work over them. Mm-hmm. And so I had to learn boundaries to, you know, not. My, my wife's just... listening to this podcast <laughs> right now. She's like, yeah. <laughs> There's a good yeah. book called Boundaries that I would recommend. Boundaries. So, and that, okay. that helped me. Yeah. But I loved it for, you know, the buy sell side for about 10 years. And, and then kind of in that 10th year, I, w- I woke up and I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And I would say it, it was, for even from from my perspective, from a worldly perspective, it's it's unfortunate because I had made it through the hard time. At that point, I was probably working legitimately working about fifteen hours a week and and doing more volume than I'd ever done before. Fifteen hours a week? Yeah, this is very efficient. You know, I got really good at communicating and paying attention to patterns, and so you know, I would I would just go right. If I had clients, I would get real clear with them and help them get ask questions and get really clear on what are they looking for and cut through a lot of the BS. You know, I kept tissues in my car because I knew people were going to have conversations that they weren't, 
that they weren't ready to have and or that they hadn't had at home. And so, I mean, mom and dad would cry a lot in the car. And, you know, so it was just like, but but we cut through a lot of the BS. But that also helped me to build relationships. And I wasn't there in real estate to to earn a commission. I was actually there because I enjoyed the people that I worked with and I got to connect with them and, and help them find a house that I, I always viewed it myself like, would I want to resell this house? And that always helped me to be like, yeah, I don't think this is the right house for you or this is. I didn't want to just close on anything, you know, and, and um, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed what I did until I didn't. <laughs> Was there like a day where you were literally like you literally woke up or you were like an epiphany moment? There was a, not a, not one day, but it, but definitely like, it seemed like it happened on a day. Cause all of a sudden it was like, oh, this is great. And like, I'd, I mean, the majority of the clients I worked with were paying cash. I didn't have to deal with financing. I mean, it was, and they were all, you know, good buyers, good price points, kind of like that, that 10th year. And I was like, man, I just, maybe I'm just burnt out. And I was that 10th year, I was out of the country more than I was in the country. And I would come, I'd be gone for a week or two, come back for a week. And I'd be like, I got to get out of here. I'm not happy. And finally I was just like, man, I'm, it's not, I'm not burnt out. Like, I just don't know if I'm, this is the right industry for me anymore. And that's why I was, what I was saying earlier, it's unfortunate because I was making a lot of money. So by a worldly perspective, I had you know a bunch of money. I still was still ramping up my career and was in the beginning of it, essentially, you know, 10 years in and, and had more money than I thought I would ever have and, and more time and, and all this stuff. And I was just like, man, I'm not happy. And I thought back honestly to the early days of, you know, at alternative mortgage options where we met and, and even younger, I was like, I didn't, money never made me happy. When I didn't have it, I grew up without money and it was like, it was fun to be able to buy stuff. But then I was like, man, this isn't actually what makes me happy. It's, it's fun. It's a dopamine rush to be able to do what you want when you want. But then I'm like, truly this wasn't, you know, so I was like, what am I going to be happy with? And I did have an epiphany moment, which, you know, where I was one day I was sitting on my couch and I was like, man, what am I going to do with my life? Like, I'm not happy with real estate. I'm not designed to be at a nine to five desk job. So I have to start a business and, you know, real estate fortunately is an industry where at least for me, when I got into it, I didn't really have mentors. And, and mortgage is the same way where you have to learn how to like sell. You have to learn how to do your accounting to keep your books. You have to learn how to do follow-up. You have to learn, you know, it's essentially you're starting a business, you know, and, and you are your own product. And so real estate gave me a lot of those tools. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start a business. And I'm sitting on my couch and, and I was like, what am I going to do? What do I like? And I looked down on my hand and I was twirling a lip balm and I was like, I've always liked lip balm. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> obviously a really random uh, huh. thing to random enough where it caught my attention. I was like, well, I've never found one that I think is actually that great. And, and, um, and at that point in my life, I was trying to buy the best stuff that I could do. And I'd paid like 50, 60 bucks for a tube of lip balm. You know, I'd found a like, thing. $50. Yeah. A tube of lip. <laughs> yeah. Not even a thing was to me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but it didn't work any better than, you know, anything else that I'd spent three bucks on. And so I was like, well, I like lip balm. This could be fun and no one's going to buy Josh's lip balm. So how can I, you know, what can I do different? And I was thinking through and, and I have a come from a strong faith background and have one. And I was like, man, nobody, nobody markets anything towards like Christians or the spiritual side. And I was like, well, maybe if I come up with like a Christian lip balm. And so I came up with uh, an idea to call it blessed lips and and uh, I was just going to market it towards Christians. And I'm like, well, 50% of the country identifies as being a Christian. So you know, nobody's really in that space. So I can try that. And, and it was probably about 10 minutes later, my mom gives me a call and, um, she's asking me about, um, some family stuff. We're talking at the end of the conversation. I'm like, Hey, like, I think I'm going to, cause she knew I wasn't happy with real estate, you know, and, and we talk often. And I was like, I think I'm going to start a lip balm company. And it went silent for a second. She's like, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, you're going to be fine or whatever you do. I got to go. And it was really that fast. And uh, it's kind of, Honestly, I was a little bit butthurt because I was all excited to, you know, start Blessed Lips. And she's like, you don't understand. You don't understand what a great <laughs> idea this is. this is. She's like, don't talk to me. And um, so whatever, finish the day and and go to sleep. And um, I'm all excited about Blessed Lips. And and um, so I wake up the next morning and my phone is ringing at 6 a.m. 
and I'm like, who's calling me? Assuming as a client, and because so I've got calls at you know three, four, five, six a.m. from people, and they expect you to answer. That's the bad side of doing high end stuff. Is whenever the high end people side note, whenever the high end people want something, they're used to getting it. So mm-hmm. I was always on 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 call. Um, so, but it's my mom and I'm like, why is she calling me at 6am? Something's obviously bad happened. So I'm like, are y'all right? And she's like, yeah. She's like, but I've been up for three hours and I couldn't have fell back asleep. And she said, I had the most vivid dream I've ever had in my entire life. She said, I've been waiting to call you, wait until a decent hour to call you. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to die. Like, you know, you have this scary dream. She's like in the dream, um, and she didn't tell me, she didn't preface it at all. And she's like, in the dream, you were, you know, five, six years old, and I have a sister that's a couple years older than me. And she's like, you and Aubrey got in this really massive fight. Said you said some really mean things to her, and for your punishment, I made you write sentences. And I, she's like, you were at the only desk in this old school building, in the middle of the school building, and you had to write, the law of kindness is on my lips. And I had to write it 50 times. And she said in the dream, she was standing behind me, behind me making sure I wrote them out. She said, every time I wrote the sentence out, the word kind and lips came off the page. She goes, she's telling me, she goes, I think if you're going to start this lip balm company, you're supposed to call it kind lips. And I was like, I got the chills and I was like, I think you're right. So like, obviously lip balm goes on your lips, your words pass back through. It's a reminder to speak kind words. And she's like, yeah. I was like, well, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. And um, got off the phone and I was like, man, mom redeemed herself from uh, the night before. Is she a wise soul? Yeah. Yeah, Your she mom. really is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it. You know, I would say it, that's a whole nother podcast, but growing up, I wasn't super close to her and, and you know, um, definitely more rambunctious boy side, but now I'd say my mom is is my best friend. You know, we talk three or four times a week, and so it's really fun to have that that her perspective in my life and, and even having kind lips and having her be so involved in terms of naming it and, you know, the direction of the company, so... So I knew like, all right, it's going to be kind lips. It's a reminder to speak kind words every time you put it on your lips. And and I was always in self-development mode too, ever since, you know, getting into real estate. And I was like, I always wanted to try and become a better version of myself. And so I had implemented, you know, behavior modification tools and in different areas. And I was like, all right, I'm going to put lip balm on my lips. I'm going to give a compliment to people around me. Like, that's fine. Cause I am on the introverted side. And so, you know, giving a compliment to somebody for some reason, like always made me nervous. Like I'm going to weird them out or, you know, I just overthought it. So it was good for me. I'm like, this is going to be a great tool for me to get out of my shell as well as, you know, to be a fun way to market a product. And as kind lips started evolving, you know, it was like, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to have this thing that has a really good intention, I have to have it be the best product in the world. So then I started learning how to make lip balm. So I had hundreds of tubes of lip balm at home and my, Fridays and Saturdays, instead of going out with friends, I stayed home and made lip balm on my stove. Like on your stove and yeah. you're cooking it up? Yeah. So you t- were you like YouTubing this or how did you figure this yeah, out? Yeah, well, I, re- I did YouTube like how to make, like how do people make lip balm, you know? And then I just through my own process of elimination, I was like, yeah, I have hundreds of tubes of, literally hundred, over a hundred tubes of lip balm. And I wrote down every ingredient on every tube. And then if it wasn't natural or organic, it got crossed off the list. So I just kept whittling the list down to what are the highest quality ingredients? What's the least amount of high quality ingredients that I can have? Because I'm a minimalist too. So I didn't want to have a bunch of different stuff in there that didn't need, you know, and some, you know, lip balms have like different oils in them, but I was like, I don't need to have olive oil and sunflower oil and castor oil. Like I just, what's the best one of those three? And I'm going to use that. Um, And so anyways, I went through that process and I finally found like, a tube of lip balm. I'm like, I would use this. I would buy this and gave it to friends and family. And so kept doing that. And then, um, you still in real estate at this time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still in real estate. And this is just like nice and weekends type out of my second bedroom. And what I still didn't even have, like, I knew the idea that kind lips existed, but I didn't have like anything I was selling. And actually I was close to it. I've worked with a designer and I'm like, Hey, can you help I've got a vision for what I want this stuff to look like. Can you put it on a label for me? And so I'm doing that, going through that process. And it wasn't perfect. And I remember like, this is like, yeah, it it was faster for me to make the formula than to get the label right. And this was like three months in. I would like think about it for a couple of days and I would move something a little bit. 
And I remember somebody gave me some a piece of advice and, and she said, she goes, she says, Tyler, about the label. And she goes, how many iPhones are there? And I was like, I don't know. There was like six or whatever at the time. She goes, well, if Apple can keep getting better every time they release an iPhone, why can't you just put this out now and change it in the future? And that would gave me permission to like move on, move forward, which is so thankful that that was some of the best advice I've ever gotten. And so it's like, all right, we're done. Started with the label, started selling it online and that was it. So, so when did the initiative behind bullying tie into it? Well, that was, that was from the get go. So I knew, you know, back to, I guess my personal life and real estate, um, kind of when I was, when I decided to go into real estate was a point in my life where I was also like, you know, I wasn't happy. I couldn't find any job that I wanted, but going through that really hard season, I turned back into my faith. And so part of me, um, going to church and getting back in my faith, I committed to like giving 10% of everything that I made to, to church or charity. And, and so in real estate, um, you know, 10% off the top cause you get, you know, you don't get tax. You get that whole check. So 10% off the top went right to church or charity and real estate. And nobody, I'd ever told a client that, or that was just my own personal thing. And so, um, as I got more successful in real estate, I wanted to give more and I did, but I could never get myself to consistently give 20%. So I would give like for sure 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 15. And then I would give to other charities and stuff like that. And so I was like, all right, if I'm going to start this company, I want to give 20% right away. Otherwise I'm never going to be able to back into it. So I was like 20%. And I was like, so with the idea of being kind, speaking kind words, I was like, what's the opposite of that? And talking to people and, and ended up having a conversation with a guy and and we were, he's like, how about anti-bullying? And I was like, you're right. Like, obviously there's such an issue with people getting bullied on social media and in the school systems. I was like, you know, let's, the perfect place to donate these monies are to places that help kids from being bullied. And so that was where the 20% came from, like my own personal, like faith journey and wanting to challenge myself to to be more charitable. And then the bullying was just the opposite of being kind. So what kind of organizations do you support and what's that 20%? Yeah, so the first one that I got connected to is called PACER. And they're actually, they're the country's largest like anti-bullying organization. And they're based in Bloomington, Minnesota. So it was really nice to go to their office, meet them, get an understanding. Um, and they're, they're, the, they're the main one. Then there's a, a few other smaller organizations that in my mind, even starting, I didn't even understand exactly what bullying was. I mean, it was like in the school systems, like people are getting bullied or on social media, you hear that term, but it was like, so I really started like diving into that and having conversations with schools and learning like the mental health stuff and the, and the suicide are, are two big symptoms of bullying. And so we started supporting some mental health organizations and some, and some suicide prevention organizations. So now as you've been scaling the business over the years, right? This is, this is full time for you. This, there's nothing else. No more real estate. I still have my real estate license. Oh, you do? Um, yeah. Okay. I do keep it active, but I, but it's, you know, few and far between. Oh, okay. Cool. So, but the, this is your primary yeah. energy. Yeah. I'm there six days a week. Yeah. That's really cool. With this initiative, like, what are you doing to get this out into the community and to create like awareness? Are you going in schools? What are you? Yeah. Good question. So, you know, it's, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm learning, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I being a visionary type of personality profile, you know, I, I've got this really high quality premium pro I, you know, obviously I'm biased or could be accused of being biased, but there isn't a formula out there that's cleaner or better. Like we have the best ingredients and the least amount of them that, you know, that you could have. And so like, I'm very much a, believer in like the quality of the product that we have. And so that, that was important to me. And I think that that ends up selling itself for people that don't, they just want a good lip balm. You know, if they want to use it as a reminder to be kind to other people, then, then that's great. And so back to a little bit to answer your question about um, three months into having kind lips, somebody had ordered 33 tubes on our website. And at that point, that was the biggest order that I'd had. I was like, this is super cool. Ship out the 33 tubes and and it was about three months after that, I get an email from the lady who had placed that order. And I was like, man, I wonder if it's 
somebody's lips broke out or why is she emailing me to, cause she wanted to set up a time to, to talk. And so we get on the phone and she's like, thank you so much for creating this product. It was really fun. I love the intention behind it. And she's like, I'm a third grade teacher and I have had the most behaviorally challenged classroom that I'd ever had in 18 years of teaching. She's like, I saw somebody posted on Facebook about your kind lips. And, and she's like, I bought one for each one of the students. And we did a lesson on speaking kind words every time you put it on. She said that, um, it was really cool and the kids loved it and they would put their lip balm on, they keep it in their desk, you know, and they, every time they put it on, they give somebody around them a compliment. And she's like, but what ended up happening that I didn't expect is she uses, she uses the name Johnny. And she's like, whenever Johnny would act up, the kids wouldn't react to him, but they would tell him he should put his kind lips on. And she's like, every time somebody would be told to put their kind lips on, they self-reflected on why they were having, being told that. And she's like, and, and the behavior changed so rapidly from people self-correcting. She's like, in this last few months, it went from being the most behaviorally challenged classroom to one of the most well-behaved classrooms I've had. And I was like, thank you so much for telling me. Like, this is super cool. So then um, I'm like, well, if this, I'm thinking afterwards after the cause, like, well, if this works for her classroom, why can't this work for every classroom? And so we started a school program after that. And so, you know, I was like, well, I could either post, pay money to post stuff on Instagram so people find out about it, or I can create this program and just try and market it and get it into the school systems and have it actually have an impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we started, I went through and funny how the world works. I kind of went back to my education background and wrote a curriculum and, and got, and started using this in the school systems. And so that's been a way that we're growing. And so part of the, part of this program in the school systems is at the end of it, there's actually a letter that the school sends home. We give a template, but a letter that the school sends home to the parents says, Hey, your kid got this tube of kind lips, but here's why it reflects our values. And it goes into challenging the parents to have a conversation with their kids about how powerful their speech is and also are they being bullied. And so the beautiful thing about that program is that kids are having this physical, tangible reminder with them to be kind. And then that letter goes home to the parents and it challenges the parents or it's a reminder for the parents to talk to their kids because mom and dad are trying to put food on the table and get laundry done and do whatever else they got to do. And they're not always rem remembering to have those conversations. And the schools love it because it takes some of the onus off of the school to be the one to like raise those children and puts it, you know, reminds the parents that the, Hey, this is your job, you know? So it's been a really fun program that way. And then it, you know, all that, and it is marketing for us too, you know, because we get sent into the home. And so it's just a win, win, win type situation. So I'm trying to find alternative ways to market where I can get awareness, um, to people without the normal ways of, you know, just spending money on Instagram or Facebook type ads. And, um, you know, last year I started this, uh, be kind, say hi thing in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And so, cause I was walking around and nobody ever said hi anymore. Now it's up to COVID and kind of the George Floyd stuff. And it was just people just kind of keep to themselves. And so I started, I made a t-shirt. I started putting these sidewalk signs around Minneapolis to just say, be kind, say hi. And people started doing it. So now we shipped them out to DC, to California, to all over the place. You know, these signs and t-shirts, which are really cool. Just, uh, just simple. I say I'm not smart enough to come up with anything complicated. Mm -hmm. So, um, so an extra skew on your website to have another. Yeah. It's just like to promote the brand. Yeah. And honestly, like I don't even make should... money off of it. It's just yeah. kind of like get it out there. Oh, okay. um, cool. I actually am going to make a big push this year for, you know, Minnesota is known for being nice. And I thought about that a lot. I thought about it for years. And I'm like, I'm, you know, all of a sudden I thought about it. And I was like, man, it'd be cool to change Minnesota for being known for being nice to being known for being kind. And then I was like, well, yeah, we changed Lake Calhoun to bit of ska. We changed the flag. And I was like, why can't we change Minnesota for being nice, being known for being kind. And so I'm going to start a, a campaign this year, you know, and I'm like, kind lips is a Minnesota company. Most people in Minnesota don't know we even exist because we haven't spent money on marketing. There's no other competition for Minnesota lip balms. Like I need to become the best known lip balm in Minnesota. Like, that shouldn't be that difficult since I'd have no competition. And so one of the things we do is, is make, um, is start a Minnesota kind campaign. 
and whether it ends up just being about kind lips or something different, but I want to make a big push to, to make Minnesota be known as the most kind state in the country and educating people on the difference of nice slash passive aggressive to what actually kind means. So, so funny you just said that because that's what I was thinking. Minnesota nice just means we're non-confrontational and passive aggressive. Yeah. Right? Like that's versus East, you know, New Jersey. Totally. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, man, this, the bullying initiative that everything you're bringing up really resonates with me right now because my wife is bringing up that a friend of mine, their daughter is four years old and is dealing with bullying in preschool, which is kind of, I wasn't expecting to learn about that from a four-year-old getting bullied. Like there's been like six documented incidents like of this. And it's like, well, how does the school, you know, it's two four-year-olds. You're like, what does the school do to help teach the classroom about this? Not just for the one individual, for everybody. Yeah. Right? You know, one of the things again, cause I'm, I'm learning and I'm still learning. Um, and our, and our school program is getting, better. And, and one of the things that I, I, this was a, you know, what's happening in my own personal life is a lot of times reflected in my business. And I think that's probably true for a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, if you're having an issue with your spouse, you can't just not have that be part of who you are when you're at the office or your kids getting bullied at school. Like you, you, that's still on your mind. And so a lot of times when I'm dealing with stuff and I realized over, over, I've known this for a long time, but this was one of those moments where it hit me differently and it was over COVID and, and I was in the restroom and I was through my hands and I, I didn't even want to look at myself in the mirror. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't, I'm not kind to myself. I can be kind to other people, but I'm not genuinely kind to, to me. I don't love myself. I don't, you know, and so I had to like really start paying attention to that and learning how to be kind to myself and start with the corny putting post-it notes on the bathroom mirror stuff to you know, and I just had to really fight through like looking at myself in the mirror and being like, I love you. I'm proud of you, that sort of stuff. And I started listening to some different podcasts about, um, identity work and, and, and learning about that. And so one of the things I've implemented or added into the school program is that kind lips isn't just a reminder to be kind to the people around you. It's also a reminder to be kind to yourself. And so with kids, we're teaching them to use it as a tool. They got to give themselves compliments. There's like a kindness pledge. They have to write kind sentences about themselves. And what I'm learning or, or seeing, and not, I'm sure other people have learned this too, but it's like when kids start to be kind to themselves, they're accepting of themselves. And when they accept themselves and they know who they are, they're less likely to let somebody else's opinion affect them as much. And so I really want to focus in, because one of the things that I learned at at Eau Claire in college is that human beings learn about 85 to 90% of what you're going to know your entire life by the time you're eight years old. And so if you're going to learn negative behaviors, how to treat people, let's, let's try and fill those. Let's try and fill up those because kids are going to learn behaviors. So let's fill those behaviors up with positive behaviors and then there won't be room for the negative behaviors. And so I'm trying to get into the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year olds and teach them as many positive behaviors and tools to be kind to themselves so that they don't listen to the noise. Because they're going to still get the noise. Yeah, that's the other side of bullying of like, there's two sides. Yeah. We got to learn, you know, teach the people not to bully. But also if you're receiving bully, right? Like that you don't need to freak out when you receive that. Yeah. Knowing your own worth, right? You can also just let it go. Because we can't control other people as much as we would like to. I know, know, right? We can't. Other people don't make you upset. Yeah. You allow yourself to become upset. Yeah. Which is, that's hard to practice. Yeah. To teach to a six-year-old. <laughs> or like a 60-year-old. Yes. <laughs> at any age, right? So where's Kind Limbs going? Where, what's the future hold? Again, it's, it's tied into like my faith background. I'm like, all right, God, like, what are we doing today? And I've felt like the past few years, it really has been a, uh, a slow play. And I'm kind of like, I'm a workhorse and I'm like, just let me go. Let me work. Let me, you know, I want to go. And I felt like I, I've been holding back and I feel like, I feel like there is a transition happening in the business, um, from the opportunities that are starting to come in for us and in the conversations that are happening where I think this will be a pivotal year where we can pivotal in the terms of where we're going to have more awareness of the brand. But 
you know, I've been wrong plenty of times in my life where I'm just like, all right, what's, I'm just trying to one day at a time type deal. So I, I, my goal for the, I think Kind Lips can be the largest lip balm company in the world. I don't, I don't have a reason. If there was a reason why it wouldn't, I would probably do something about it. I say, I'm, I'll probably be the reason why it's not, <laughs> you know, cause from a quality of product, it's as good as, if not better than everything else out there from a mission. There's no other lip balm company that even has a mission, let alone, you know, what we're doing and is having an impact. And there's no other company that can be in the school systems and, and kind of, you know, and do what we're doing. So, so I think it should be the biggest lip balm company in the world. Um, it's just going to come down to how fast does that happen? And yeah. And who's in charge of it when it happens? Cause we'll, we'll see. So reminds me a lot of your friend, um, Zach would love your melon. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they built that whole business on it. Just a great initiative. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and went to the moon. Right. I think you can do the same thing, man. I appreciate that. If you want it, you can go get it. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to share all this. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah. It's a really interesting story. I learned so much just sitting <laughs> across from you today, but thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.